Captain America, the first Avenger, aka Captain America 1, movie review. So this is one of my scripted movie review series in which I take an old movie review I wrote years, years ago on the weblog and try to make a YouTube video out of it for whatever that may or may not be worth. Uh, in this case, this movie came out way back in 2011, although I was a little bit late to seeing it, I didn't see it and review it until 2012. But it's an interesting movie, and I think really to make sense out of it, or to appreciate what it's trying to do, you need to understand a little bit about comic book history, or the history of Captain America, the comic book character. I apologize for this, but I, I do think it's necessary in this case. So if you're not familiar with the history, you, you may find this interesting, and I think this will, will change maybe how you view this movie. If you're already familiar with this history, I guess just bear with me through this section, or uh, keep an eye out for anything I get wrong or misrepresent, and maybe you can let me know in the comments down below. This is, this is all true to the best of my knowledge, but sometimes I can, I can uh, get things wrong every now and again. So, Captain America, the comic book character, uh, was created during the 1940s, during World War II, and at that time, I guess because of the war, uh, it was quite popular to have uh, patriotic-themed superheroes. Uh, th there were a number of these uh, at a number of different comic book companies at the time. Uh, characters like Liberty Bell, uh, Uncle Sam and the Freedom Fighters was, was another comic book team. Uh, the Star Spangled Kid. Yeah, you, you can look these characters up on Wikipedia. They've, they've got interesting histories, all of them. Um, but they all started out as very patriotic characters during World War II, which is a, another little interesting piece of pop culture history, uh, is that the um, using World War II as a, as a backdrop for kind of cheap pulp entertainment goes way back right to the days of World War II itself. Um, I think World War II as a vehicle for entertainment uh, has changed a lot over the years, and it's kind of gone through cycles, where it will go one way and then go back again another way. Uh, right during the war, and I think immediately afterwards, uh, it, it was quite popular to have a lot of cheap entertainment uh, you know, pulp comics and pulp adventures and, and uh, action movies uh, be based about around World War II, which I, in retrospect seems a little bit ironic because, you know, you'd think that people who were that close to the horrors of the actual war uh, wouldn't, would want to kind of treat it more seriously or would want to have a little bit more distance from it. But it seems that that kind of respectful distance for the horrors of the war came a little bit later. Um, I, I've heard that uh, the actual horrors of the Holocaust and what the Nazis were doing in the Holocaust didn't really sink into the popular consciousness until 1960. Or, or at least it didn't become the main story of the war until the 1960s. It was, it was a, a little bit of a side story. Uh, you know, people definitely knew about it. Um, but the, the, that didn't become like the main lesson or the main atrocity of the war until then. Um, but even putting the Holocaust aside, there was plenty of barbarity just on the fighting lines, uh, which is, yeah, it, it's a little bit strange, but it, it does seem to be the way it was, that, that it, was, it was pop cultural entertainment. And then, I guess, for whatever reason, and, and what was the reason? I, I don't know. I, I guess part of it was the legacy of the Holocaust, and maybe part of it was the Vietnam War changed how we viewed wars, or maybe a, a, just another shift in cultural attitudes. Uh, I think eventually it became a little bit taboo uh, to use World War II as in an, in an irrelevant way, uh, where you were just uh, using it as a cheap background for pulp fiction. Uh, and then uh, I, I think we saw another wave of that in America, maybe, in the early 2000s, where there was movies like Saving Private Ryan or Schindler's List, which presented this as very serious stuff. Stuff, stuff you don't want to fool around with or stuff you don't want to make light of. Which makes Captain America's legacy as a pop superhero star in World War II a little bit awkward. 
But I'm getting ahead of myself uh, because actually I, I need to go back uh, and talk about what happened to superheroes in comic books after World War II. Uh, they went out of fashion in the 1950s. Uh, in the 1950s, uh, comic books were still popular, but it was Western comic books. It was horror comic books were very popular in the 1950s and controversial science fiction comic books. Uh, the, the age of the superhero was done uh, by, the, by the 1950s. There, there were a few of them uh, that stuck around, um, but only a few. And then in the 1960s, there was a revival of superheroes, uh, what comic books fans call the, the Silver Age. And that happened in different ways in Marvel and in DC. But over at Marvel, it was Stan Lee who was, I think, uh, almost single-handedly responsible for creating most of the Marvel superheroes in the 1960s. Or depending on who you ask, he just took credit for other people's uh, creations. But, but Stan Lee is, is a name associated with that. Um, and Stan Lee and Jack Kirby revived... Uh, created a bunch of their own superheroes in the 1960s. Uh, Spider-Man, the Fantastic Four, Thor, uh, yeah, yeah, all, all the Incredible Hulk, you know, all, all the famous Marvel superheroes they created during that time. And they also brought back Captain America, who was uh, not one of their original creations, or not, at least not one of Stan Lee's original creations. I think, actually, was Jack Kirby one? I, uh, maybe, maybe it was one of Jack Kirby's original creations from way back in the 40s. Um, but he, he was like the one holdover in the Marvel Universe. Well, okay, one of a couple. One of a uh, couple holdovers in the Marvel Universe uh, who had been from the Golden Age in the 1940s. Uh, and then they, they decided that he had been frozen in ice. Uh, and that, that was the reason why uh, he, he hadn't been in comic books since the 1940s. Now, actually, somebody might say, well, what about the comic books in the 1950s that featured Captain America? For, forget about those for now. Uh, Stan, Stan Lee at the time ignored those comic books. Uh, and St Stan Lee decided that uh, Captain America had been frozen in ice up in the Arctic. Uh, and that was the reason that nobody had heard of him for the last 20 years, but now he was getting dethawed and he was coming out of the ice. Now, Stan Lee had a little thing he was doing over at Marvel where each superhero had to have some sort of uh, a hook or a catch uh, or a, a bit of an angst uh, to get the reader's attention. Uh, and this was in contrast to, to what was happening at DC. At DC comic books, it was just kind of a whole bunch of like super powered, super tough uh, characters with not really a lot of angst, or at least not at that time. Um, but Stan, Stan Lee realized that to kind of really get the, the readers interested, you needed to have some sort of tragedy or something like that to hook the reader into. So all of Stan Lee's creations had a little bit of angst that you were supposed to buy into or get emotionally involved with. And Captain America had uh, two forms of angst uh, in, in the 1960s. Uh, the one was uh, he had been frozen in ice for the last 20 years. Uh, and so when they thought him out, he was, a, he was always slightly out of step with his time. He had missed out on 20 years of history and culture and all his old buddies were now 20 years older and it was awkward associating with them because uh, he had an age, he'd been frozen in the ice. Uh, so this kind of man out of time uh, became one of Captain America's themes. The other was he felt angst about Bucky. Now, Bucky was Captain America's teenage sidekick uh, because at, at the time in the 1940s, it was popular for all these superheroes to have teenage sidekicks. You know, Batman had Robin. Actually, I said teenage, but I, I think actually in, in a lot of cases, they were portrayed as being boys. Um, I don't actually know offhand which one Bucky was. Uh, maybe it was a boy sidekick. Anyways, a, a kid sidekick. So Batman had Robin, uh, Captain America had Bucky. Now Stan Lee didn't like this idea of having a kid sidekick. Uh, he, he thought it was child endangerment for the hero to be bringing a kid along with him on his, on his adventures. He thought it was just stupid and unrealistic. 
Um, so Stanley killed off Bucky. Uh, he got killed off off screen, so like, um, so to speak. So when Captain America woke up from being frozen in the ice for 20 years, uh, the last thing he remembered was that he and Bucky were on this missile and he had escaped, but what happened to Bucky? And oh no, Bucky must have died up on that missile. Uh, and the guilt over kind of losing uh, his, his kid psychic or being responsible for the death of this kid uh, was always looming over Captain America. So during the Stanley era of superheroes, uh, the which which was essentially the the golden age of Marvel superheroes, even though properly speaking it was the silver age of comic books superheroes. Anyways, dur during the during Stanley's golden period, uh, the defining characteristics of Captain Marvel was he was a man out of time, and there was all this angst over having lost Bucky. So. That's what this first movie needs to set up. It needs to establish Captain America as some sort of a superhero in the 1940s uh, in order for the later movies to portray him as the man who is out of time. Now, in, in Stan Lee's time, uh, it was only 20 years that, that Captain America had been frozen in ice. Uh, now, of course, be, because time marches on, this has gotten increasingly awkward in the Marvel comic books. In the, in the Marvel comic books, they have a rather fluid um, fluid regard to time, or I think they call it a sliding time scale or something like that. So at first it was 20 years, and it was 30 years, and it was 40 years, and it was 50 years, and it's always kind of longer and longer. But Captain America is always tethered to World War II. Uh, he, had, he had been in World War II, and then he had been asleep in the ice, and he'd woken up in the modern era. And even though the exact time has kind of shifted over the years, uh, that, that's always been his story. So, so that, that's, that's what they have to set up. And that goes a fair amount uh, to explaining uh, some of the awkwardness of this movie, is because they're trying to set all that up. And they're, they're at, at once trying to set up Captain America's roots as a World War II superhero, uh, but also he, he needs to, at the end of this movie, he needs to be set up as the man out of time for the Avenger movie. Okay. So, I, I guess there's a, a lot of questions about how well this worked, but I'm going to start with the most obvious question, which is, was it entertaining? Did it work as a movie? And the answer is, eh, okay. It wasn't terrible. Uh, it did have a long, slow, boring start. And then, even once the action did start, it seemed a little bit episodic to me. There are various little mini-climaxes, mini but the movie didn't do a good job of keeping the tension or the momentum going between action scenes, causing me to get a little bit bored. The final confrontation with the Red Skull was really a disappointment. Uh, it, it could have been a really cool fight scene because here was the Red Skull who had all the same strength and powers as, as Captain America. And I, I know that's a classic criticism of Marvel movies, especially Marvel movies from this stage, is that the villain was always just an exact clone of the her hero. And I, okay, f fair enough, that, that would have been a legitimate criticism of this, but when, when, when the villain is, a, is just a clone of the, the hero's superpowers, say what you want about that, at, at the very least you get an interesting fight scene out of it, because you've got two, two antagonists who are exactly evenly matched. But instead, spoiler alert, I guess, uh, they, they cheap out with this ending, which just seems like it's borrowed from Raiders of the Lost Ark. Uh, so, I, I mean, I mean it, it seems like they just stole their ending from Raiders of the Lost Ark, which is disappointing because one, you shouldn't steal somebody else's ending, and two, uh, I, I thought, it, it means there's no exciting fight between, between the hero and the villain. Also, I've always thought um, the cool thing about Captain America, uh, and I think this is in common with a number of Jack Kirby's characters, is that shield. You, you know, he, 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 
in, in the comic books and in, I think in a lot of the cartoons, he, he uses that shield to, to, to do some really cool stuff. He's just, he seems to have this momentum where he's running with the shield and he uses the shield to knock things down and he throws the shield and he's running and he catches the shield where he's still running. Uh, and this came through in a lot of Jack Kirby's out, uh, artwork for the character, this, this uh, kind of just running and jumping and throwing and carrying the shield around, which I always thought was really cool and which I think the Marvel movies have done a decent job of transferring to the screen. Um, but in some of these scenes in Captain America, uh, the first Avenger, they give him a gun that he's firing. And I'm like, oh no, don't give Captain America a gun. What's the point of that? He's, he's got to be using his, that shield and that running and that throwing to defeat the enemies. It, it, it just, I, I don't know actually. Uh, I'm a little bit hesitant to say he never had a gun in the comics. Because truth be told, I don't know the comics that well. I mean, so somebody let me know in the comment in the comments down below. How, how common was it for Captain America to have a gun? I I, I feel like that's out of character for him, uh, and I, I don't think at, at at any rate I don't think it worked in the movie uh, because you you don't want a superhero to be firing a gun. It it just seems like. Dude, you're already Captain America. You're already super strong. You already have this great shield. You, you, uh, having a gun is just unfair. To have all, all a gun on top of all that. Anyways, uh, also the the character of Bucky felt completely pointless in the context of this movie. Now, in the context of the larger Captain America story. Okay, you know, after having kind of three or four Captain American movies, um, four if you count some of the Avenger movies maybe, you, you can see where this is paying off in the long run. Um, but at the time when this movie first came out in 2011, nobody was really sure what they were going to do with this character. Uh, uh, and even those of us who knew the history of the comic books suspected that, that there, there was going to be a payoff in later movies, but we weren't sure at the time. Um, and so in that regard, the character arc of Bucky maybe didn't make a lot of sense within the context of just the first movie. Uh, they, they aged him up. So he, he was no longer a kid sidekick. Now he was Captain America's best friend. Um, but it didn't really seem like he had much of a purpose in this movie. Uh, also, as far as I'm concerned, agonizing over Bucky's death once is enough. Once per movie is enough. So, such a big deal is made out of the fact that Bucky might be dead behind enemy lines. Captain America goes on a heroic rescue attempt. Then there's great relief when Bucky is found alive and well. And then after all that, then he gets killed off a second time, or, or appears to get killed off a second time, uh, so that Captain America can feel sad for Bucky all over again. And all this for someone who, at least as he's portrayed in the movie, is just a generic buddy character and never developed beyond that. And consequently, someone that the audience wouldn't really care about, except that we're told we have to care about him because Captain America does. Well, I can just about manage to make myself care a little bit about Bucky the first time he is missing in action behind in enemy lines, but when we lose him for the second time, I can't be bothered caring anymore. Captain America has a brief sad scene with a bottle of alcohol after Bucky dies, and then after that he promptly forgets about Bucky as well and no one ever mentions him again for the rest of the movie. Now, as I somewhat suspected at the time, and as we now know later, this, this is set up that's going to pay off in the later movies. Uh, but in this movie, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I, there is, and I alluded to this at the beginning of my review, a little bit of awkwardness now in this day and age of playing World War II for Pulp Fiction. Although um, I think we, we may be coming around to the other side of the cycle. Uh, you know, immediately after uh, Saving Private Ryan and uh, Schindler's List, it was taboo for a little period. 
but now after Quentin Tarantino and all that kind of stuff, may, may, maybe it's acceptable again. The complicated question of is this okay or um, maybe even is it okay in children's entertainment to present these jingoistic heroes is a complicated question. Um, and I, I recognize that this is all Captain America's uh, legacy from the comic books. And in, in the context of the comic books, I find it a little bit fun. I mean, it's it's cheesy and kitschy and, and kind of a fun sort of way, especially nowadays, kind of looking back at those old 1940s comics. Um, which is largely how the movie plays it. Uh, there are a couple scenes when they seem to be emphasizing that Captain America just loved America so much and he had this great all-American heart. I'm, I'm thinking maybe of the early scenes where he's scolding people in the movie theaters for not showing proper respect to the f newsreel footage of American soldiers. Uh, and really that mostly overly long introduction. Uh, and, and again, I, I know this is kind of getting back to his true comic book origins, but it plays a little bit awkwardly. Or at least I thought it played a little bit awkwardly. Um, I thought, I don't know. I, I, I thought I, I felt in the movie that the filmmakers weren't sure whether they wanted to go with the kind of the kitschy pulp aspect of World War II or whether they wanted to go with the respectful patriotic aspect of World War II and seem to be playing around with both of them, at least at the beginning of the movie. Uh, by the second half of the movie, it's obvious we're going for the kitschy pulp aspect of World War II. Killer Nazi robots, evil Nazi doctors, Nazi spies who have secret submarine boats located just outside New York that nobody notices for some reason, fights with Nazis on speeding trains, uh, and then instead of mindless evil Nazis, we go to mindless evil Hydra, who are like the super Nazis, the cult within the Nazis. So at that point, obviously, we are firmly in the pulp world. Uh, and at that point, maybe it's okay to play this all for pulp fun because that's the world we're living in uh, or that's the world the movie has created. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, I think for all its faults, this was the best Captain America origin story we were likely to get. Uh, they, they, the filmmakers and the screenwriters had inherited a rather awkward, awkward backstory from the comics. What, what they needed to do is they needed to get the Captain America, the guy who had a lot of angst from being, uh, from, from having lost time or from being in the wrong time period and from having lost Bucky. And they managed, managed to set both of those up by the end of the movie. Not altogether seamlessly, the setup was a little bit clunky as I've been complaining, but, but they got there in the end and they were largely respectful of the comic book origin with all its mixed baggage that comes along with it. So I, I, I think th this was the best film we were likely to get. Uh, I, I have some criticisms and I have to admit this isn't my favorite Marvel movie, uh, at least in terms of watchability factor you know, like being entertained by a factor. But uh, I, I, th I think they largely did the best they could with the story.